Hi, welcome back to Space Thoughts. Happy New Year 2023. I know I've been a bit absent with making videos um, at the, towards the end of 2022, but I want to start off 2023 with something that's extremely significant, in my opinion, um, that occurred. And I think it's going to, have a, it's going to have multiple repercussions and really a lot of influence going down the road into 2023 and beyond. Specifically, what happened on January 5th, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia filed, made a filing with the UN Secretary General in New York and said, basically said, one year from now, we're going to withdraw from the Moon Agreement. Now, you've heard me talk about the Moon Agreement before and how, and, and in relation to space resources. And the Moon Agreement is one of those very controversial treaties that really has, sta it has standing as international law, but it really never has the really any teeth to it. Doesn't have a really uh, binding effect on on other states because mainly because the big, the major space fair nations like the U.S., the Russian Federation, and the People's Republic of China never really even became party to it. They basically said we don't want any part of this. So the Moon Agreement was basically is basically has more than enough signatures. I mean, fifteen or so plus. <clears throat> excuse me, that to make it by effective real international law, but it really has no legal effect. And it's very controversial for a lot of reasons. We're not going to go into it in this video, but it is it is good to know that it is a sibling to the U, uh, UN Conference on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, the Law of the Sea Agreement. They, these two were proposed at the same time. And basically when the U.S. was presented with both of these, said, okay, well, we'll, we'll start talking about UNCLOS, but we're not going to do, we're not going to do anything with the Moon Agreement. We're going to let it just subside. Now, Throughout the years of the Moon Agreement, I basically said that, you know, yeah, it's out there. Yeah, it, pro it probably doesn't really have a lot of influence because a lot of the big spacefaring nations haven't signed on to it. But there's always this there's always this catchy thing of customary international law that sits in the shadows. And my, my, my concern throughout that time was that if it continues to sit out there and the U countries like the U.S. don't start pushing back against it, it might actually gain influence in the shadows of, of customary international law and actually gain some sort of momentum. And actually, we saw a lot of this, especially after space resources. My understanding is there were some some, some signatories to the uh, Moon Agreement that were trying to propel it forward because the idea of space resources basically supplants the whole idea, uh, the whole rationale underlying legal authority that the Moon Agreement would ever have. But... What happened in, in 2020 was the Trump administration came out and issued an executive order and basically outright disclaimed the idea of the Moon Agreement. They pushed back saying, we're not going to become part of it. We don't consider it binding international law. And therefore, we are not going to, you know, we, we, we completely reject it. However, we do have this concept called space resources that we do push forward, that we consider consistent with the Outer Space Treaty and something that is going to actually become very um is going to become the legal standard or the legal archetype for the future. Now, there was a group called the Vanderbilt Group, and uh, I did a video on this, and I'll link, I'll link it at the end. They got together shortly after that executive order and basically did a major pushback saying, no, 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 we can't have individual states going basically going rogue and doing their own thing on the mood. We need this overarching legal authority to create, you know, to basically you know, regulate the idea of commercializing the moon, the asteroids, comets, what have you, these resources in outer space. And, and a lot of it was alluding to the moon agreement itself. And again, I'll link that video at the end of this so you can act, so you can look at it and, and hear my thoughts on that. And again, this is back in 2020, I believe. So again, the idea of the moon agreement sits out there. The, the pushback by the Trump administration was very good because it really... It really set. It really kind of pushed back on all any kind of cast light on any shadows that, of customary international law that might have been growing, and of course, space resources was growing, and you have a lot of states uh, that have actually recognized the concept of space resources. And the recent one was last year was was Japan when they signed their own domestic space resource law. And incidentally, right now there is a non governmental. Uh, lander going to the moon that is under the jurisdiction of the Japanese government under their space resource law that is going to go and land on the moon and harvest space resource, harvest regolith, fly it back to Earth and sell it to NASA, which would essentially create an actual um, activity involving space resources and give that and actually give that concept more underlying pins. 
So what about the moon agreement? Definitely the, what, what's happening with iSpace and this Japanese lander are going to have a significant effect on, on the idea of the moon agreement. It's definitely going to make it even less, uh, less how can you say, influential. But what Saudi Arabia did, and Saudi Arabia is an interesting country because you have to, uh, and, and in the Middle East, you have to really watch it because they're, they are getting very active in space in terms of their policy and what they want to do. So what, what the Saudi Arabia did on the 5th was they came to the UN and said, we're out of the moon agreement. Now, they weren't one of the original signatories, but they what we call they acceded to it. In other words, they said, okay, we, 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 didn't, we didn't actually have a chance to ratify this initially, but we're going to bind ourselves legally to this after the fact. And, they, and, and I'm not sure exactly when they did that, but the idea is they became part of the, the moon agreement. Now, interestingly, last year, uh, Saudi Arabia also signed the Artemis Accords. So there, there is a bit of discord there about the, the idea of the Artemis Accords and the moon agreement. They really don't, in my opinion, they really can't coexist. So I'm um, going to bring this up. And here is the notification. Now, tre all treaties have a means of getting out of the uh, of basically withdrawing and basically the standard way of doing that is by filing a notification that say one year from now we're out of it we're, we're withdrawing ourselves from the from the from that agreement and we don't consider ourselves legally bound by its precepts anymore so what what saudi arabia did is they said basically per article it was 20 of the moon agreement on january 5th 2024 we are going to be officially out of it. We are no longer going to be part of it. So now you have a position where the moon agreement has been taking a lot of hits from, from executive orders, from uh, actual activities that are being performed right now, and the continuing pressure and the continuing states actually adopting the idea of space resources. Now you have a state that's actually withdrawn from the moon agreement. And when you have, when, when, when states start leaving it, you're going, uh, especially agreements that are kind of wobbly to begin with, they are not, it doesn't bode well for the future of it. So, um, with all with all this, the question is, you know, why, why did Saudi Arabia do this? Well, I think one, they they became part of the Artemis Accords, and they're reading the writing on the wall that the idea of an overarching regulatory authority, similar to like the international international seabed authority, it's not going to happen. It's just not politically viable, and it's going to take decades to actually get something done, as it has with the international seabed authority. So. Being part of the Artemis Accords, they're looking. They're looking at reality. They're going to. They they want to be involved in actually developing. You know, exploiting, developing, what have you, the the lunar environment and asteroids. So, but the problem is this moon agreement. Their their obligations of the moon agreement aren't going to let them do that. So, the key, the best thing to do is just to get out of it so they can do it. However, right now they really don't have a space law, but. My thoughts are right now, because they have made this move, they are probably in the process of developing their own, own domestic space law for non-governmentals. And within that, they'll probably have a space resources provision, similar to other states like the UAE, like Japan, like the US, like Luxembourg. They're going to make it legal for their private, their private citizens and their non-governmentals to actually perform these space resource activities. And I think it's because they read the writing on the wall join the Artemis Accords and see that this is the direction things are moving in. So what does that say about the moon agreement? Long-term, I think you're going to see more countries, more states um, withdraw from it. I think you're going to see uh, states like Australia, which is, which was one of the original signatories to the Artemis Accords. I think you're going to see them back away from this as well. Mexico as well um, it, uh, became part of the Artemis Accords, but they're also a member of the moon agreement. You might see them as well <clears throat> move away from that move away from the moon agreement and more towards the idea of space resources. So again, the effect of this notification is that they're not immediately withdrawn. They're still, they're still a member of the, uh, of the moon agreement, but the, uh, but per the agreement, they have one year from January 5th, 2023, they will no longer be part of it, no longer legally bound by it. And uh, I think that's going to be a major hit for the moon agreement. And again, I think you're going to see other states that are involved in the moon agreement are going to just, you know, just slide away from it and possibly make filings of their own. Whether it happens this year or next year, I think it's something that is definitely in the cards. Um, again, Saudi Arabia, 
one to watch. They're getting very, they're getting very persistent, very focused on space and space policy right now. And again, I think it wouldn't surprise me if they are developing their own domestic space law. Um, and I think a lot because they're seeing their neighbor, the United Arab Emirates, are making a lot of progress in uh, non-governmental space activities, uh, especially you know with the site. And they've also adopted the idea of space resources. So they are reading the writing on the wall saying, you know what, we got to get, we got to get going too. And we don't, we, we, we want to be a very major influencer in the Middle East for uh, this idea of non-governmental space and developing space. So again, I think you're going to see the move in that direction. The Saudis are definitely somebody to watch. This move was not insignificant. It certainly uh, is going to shake the moon agreement up pretty, pretty well. And probably, I think probably within the next few years, you're going to see the moon agreement pretty much in some, in my opinion, be something that I wouldn't even consider a threat either via customary international law, just because there's so many activities that are moving ahead and creating customary international law that are going to actually supplant it altogether. Even though I, right now, I think it really doesn't have much, how can you say influence to, to begin with. So again, that's kind of a, a long and short discussion of where I think, you know, the, my thoughts on uh, this action right here. Again, extremely significant um, and something to watch and definitely an interesting start to 2023. My briefing letter, the Pressy. Uh, again, I'm talking, you know, space policy, space law, space, geopolitics is moving along at a very big pace right now. And uh, this is my quarterly briefing letter. It comes out four times, four times a year for each quarter, one, two, three, and four. And basically, I cover a whole gambit of information. This is a cover page to my last quarterly issue out in December. And the the, the contents here, the index at the beginning here, basically gives you an idea of what, what is contained within this letter. This particular letter was um, almost 100 pages. So there's a lot of information in here. Uh, if you want to become a subscriber, www.thepressy.net. Uh, go there. There's a link where you can email me and ask for a sample issue and what i'll do is i'll send you a sample issue to look at for yourself and um basically you know and basically uh see whether or not you want to become a subscriber again i'd love to have you a subscriber because this is one of the this is one of the things that is again i really pay attention to what's going on and i try and of everything that's going on i try and basically filter it out and put it into this letter now there are special issues as well that, that I put in between the quarterly issues. And I may even be doing a special issue on uh, this act, uh, this action by Saudi, Saudi Arabia itself. So that's all I have for this video. I hope to do a lot more this year in 2023 than I did in 2022 to keep you informed. Uh, again, stay safe, stay healthy, and we will talk to you next time.